we're just now wrapping up a series that I've been quite passionate about. Because at this church, there's really four things we're going to talk about over and over again. And in fact, if you don't want to hear about these things, this probably wouldn't even be a very good church for you to be a part of. Because the first thing is, you're just going to hear us all the time pointing you to Jesus and reminding you that He's our Savior. Amen? That's something we need to hear constantly. The other thing we want to hear all the time is that Jesus Christ has come to baptize us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Can we give Him applause for that? You know, another thing we're just going to be constantly reminding you about is that Jesus is here to heal us. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He can heal us physically, emotionally, mentally. Most importantly, He heals us spiritually. And then last week, I talked with you about the reminder that He's coming back for His church. Amen? And that's you and me. Now, today, I want to talk with you about getting ready. Getting ready to see the Lord. And I want to kick off with kind of a, a, it's a humorous story. This actually happened uh, in the spring. And I had uh, Joe and Tim were out at our house, and uh, we were putting in a picket fence around the garden because the deer like to eat our stuff. And so um, Tim's there with the post hole digger, and he's digging holes. And all of a sudden, he hits something, and his face lights up. There's, there's something there. And he, and he gets down and he digs and he pulled something out. It was a package wrapped up in plastic. And Tim, he looks back at me and he goes, it's a treasure. And he's, he's starting to rip into it. And I went, Tim, don't. It's a dead cat. The lady that lived there before, she was a cat hoarder. Oh, by the way, when I tell him it's a dead cat, he goes like this. Ah! And he throws it. <laughs> and dead cat wrapped up in plastic goes flying across the yard. It was pretty funny. You had to be there for that. The lady that lived there before, she was a cat hoarder. And her answer was anytime the cat died, she'd wrap him in plastic and bury him in the backyard. And so Tim found the treasure. And, uh, you know, as I'm talking with you about the, the treasure we have, about storing up for yourself treasure in heaven, I'm not talking about dead cats. I'm not talking about stuff like that. You know, the Bible talks about don't store up for yourself treasure on earth because that treasure, moth will destroy it, uh, you know, rust will corrode it. It's not going to last. But he says instead, store up for yourself treasure treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth will destroy. And I want to talk with you about that today. And you know, there's two, there's two keys that really determine everything about your eternity. Two keys that determine virtually everything. The first thing is what you believe. What you believe here on earth will determine where you spend eternity and what you do on earth will determine how you spend eternity. And you know, on the line of eternity, there's six main events that happen. In your forever life, I want you to think about this. It, and I, I almost use the term the timeline of eternity, but how many of you know in eternity, there, it's not a timeline, okay? It's just forever before, and it's going to be eternity beyond. And uh, so on that line, there's six main events in your forever life. And the first one is your life. You're here right now, right? So you're in the first one. If you're happy to be in the first of the six, give the Lord an applause for that. It's your life. Now, uh, during your life, that's the uh, relationships we have. It's the influence we have. It's during this time right here. In this little blip in eternity that you're here, that you're alive. And it's in that time while you're alive that you have the opportunity to believe and put your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you. Or it's an opportunity to reject and say thank you, but no thank you. And you know, it's what you believe and what you do during this life that impacts all the rest of eternity. Now, it's possible that during our life, we're going to be raptured. Amen? But if not, then the next event in your 
in your line there of the six main events is your death. Now, are you, you may not be looking forward to it, but are you prepared for that? Are you prepared? That's an important question for us to answer. Now, the Bible tells us that you do, you do not die spiritually. That you only die physically. And in fact, the Apostle Paul says that our body is really just a tent. It's like a tent that kind of houses the part of us that lasts forever. And that's your spirit. Now, Jesus taught upon your death that you're either going to be with God forever based on what you believe, or you're going to be apart for him in a place called hell, which can I tell you, hell was not created for people. Do you know that? Do you all know that? Hell was not created for people. It was created for Satan. It was created for Satan and his fallen angels. But the Bible tells us really there's two choices here. That God has provided an exit strategy for us to avoid hell. It's through Christ Jesus. But the fact is during their life there will be some who believe and put their faith in him. And their eternity will be spent with him. And there will be those that close the door and reject him. And the Bible tells us they will be spending eternity in a place God did not want them to be. Are you with me? Okay. It says in John uh, 3.15, it says, Everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. He identifies there's only two possibilities that are there. So the next big event is your resurrected body. Remember, I read the verse last week about the resurrection of the dead. It was in 1 Thessalonians. It says the dead, that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the, uh, with the trumpet call of God. And it says the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, And then those who are remain on the earth at that point will be raptured to be caught up with the Lord. So if you die before the rapture, then there, there's going to be an actual physical bodily resurrection. In John, it says this, a time is coming when all those who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Now, let me just talk to you just a little bit about these, uh, these resurrected bodies. They're not going to be the same old broken down bodies you already have. Amen. They're going to be immortal bodies. Um, Jesus gave us a sneak peek of what these immortal bodies are like. Do you remember he died and he was resurrected? Now, this resurrected Lord, was he recognized? Yeah, they, they recognized him. But he wasn't contained by physical barriers. You remember in the New Testament, after he rose from the dead, he walked right through a wall. I mean, that's crazy stuff. That's awesome stuff. So these physical bodies, they're not going to be subject to, um, to death. They're not going to be uh, subject to sickness and disease. They're going to be glorified bodies. They will be heavenly, immortal bodies. How many of you think that's a pretty cool thing? Amen. Then there's the repayment. What's repayment? Well, that's where you receive your reward. You guys all like rewards? It's where you receive your reward or your restitution uh, uh, all throughout eternity based on what you believed or did not believe and what you did or did not do. Bible talks about the Bema Seat. Let me hear you say Bema Seat. Um, it can be translated Judgment Seat. When you read through the New Testament and you read about the great white, throne of judgment. Does that make anybody just a little nervous right there? Right? It's like, oh my goodness, I don't know that I want to go there. But yeah, the great white throne. Now, let me tell you something about the Bema Seat. Is it's not simply a, pl a place where, uh, where justice is executed. The Bema Seat was a real place. In fact, the Apostle Paul, it was believed that he sat at the Bema Seat when he was falsely accused of trying to lead people into worship in ways that were contrary to what their law allowed, he was drugged to the Bema seat. And there he went on trial. Now, at the Bema, at the Bema seat, it's not only a place 
where justice would be executed. It's also a place where rewards would be distributed, just like during the Olympic type deal. It would be a, a Bema type seat where the athletes would be rewarded for how they did in their race. And so that's kind of interesting to think about. And for the faithful uh, of Christ, the Bema seat really should be thought more of as the reward seat. How many of you like that better, the reward seat? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, I'm actually looking forward to the reward seat of Christ. Just like those Olympians on those raised blocks. Now, uh, the choices you make on earth have huge impact in eternity. Small choices can have huge impact. Think for a moment, uh, even the widow. You guys know the story of the widow, and she gave two widow's mites, which wasn't even like two pennies. But the Bible says it was all she had, and that she gave all she had. And then he goes on and says that she would be greatly rewarded in eternity. Let me go ahead and uh, draw something here. This here's the line of eternity right there. It was there before you. It will be there after your life on earth. And in this line, there's one little blip right in there. It's where you're at right now. Can you guys see that? That's your life. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Because this is pretty radical stuff. Because it's what you believe and what you do during this little blip on this line of eternity that will affect your entire future eternity. And the challenge is this. Often we want to live for the, lo- live for the dot. It's all we see. We just see where we're at right now. And we think life is all about, boy, I want to acquire wealth. I want to get bigger and better houses. I want new cars. I want this. I want that. And I got news for you. Those things in and of themselves are not bad things. The challenge is those things won't make it out of the dot. Those things aren't carried out into eternity. How many of you know you're not going to be driving your BMW down the pearly, you know, down the golden streets of heaven, right? Your, your BMW ain't going there, okay? It's not going there. And so the challenge for us is to not just look at the here and now and say, gee, what can I do to make my life comfortable here and now, but to believe and live and make choices that will outlive the dot. The challenge is to not live for the dot, but to live for the line. Live for what will impact your eternal life. Amen? Now, for most of us, that dot represents 70 years, give or take a few. You know, it's what you believe or choose not to believe during that dot that will impact impact your eternity. So I want to talk with you a little bit about preparing for that awesome day. Preparing for that awesome day when you're going to see the Lord face to face. Now, runners do not show up to the race, wearing a backpack, wearing hip waders, Uh, you know. (laughs) We took the youth group to the beach a few weeks ago, and it was the day before the Hood to Coast runners uh, were going to be showing up at Seaside. Did anybody see my picture I posted? And and they had the finish line there. I thought, oh, this will be good. This will be good. Joey, get a picture of me going across the finish line. You know, and I made some snarky post because I had some friends running in the race. I said, hey, man, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but I was at the finish line a whole day ahead of you. Now, I didn't tell him I ran. I ran there. One person took the bait. How long did it take you to get there? Mm, about two hours. And then about, a, about run about 15 feet. That was it. Whoa. And then where was your team? Well, they were on the bumper cars. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was funny. That was pretty funny. But, you know, runners, uh, and of course, somebody commented on that. Yeah, sure, and you ran the whole way wearing your blue jeans and your, you know, whatever. You know, because he knows. Nobody's going to show up to race day wearing their blue jeans, and you're going to dress for the race, right? You don't 
run the race with your backpack on and your hip waders and hauling all your stuff. What you do is you want to lighten the load. And this is what it says. It says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, would, witnesses, would you read the underlines with me? He said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. I want you to think about this for a moment. What hinders you in running effectively? Do you have toxic relationships that constantly pull you back? That's good. You don't need that. You don't need that. Are you tangled up in some addictive lifestyles? Okay. What he's talking about is throw the stuff off. Throw the stuff off because this is our only chance. This is your blip. This is your only... This is your only blip on, on the line of eternity for you to make account. So throw off everything that's going to hinder you, the sin that entangles you, and run with perseverance. Because the way that we run this race, it's what we believe that gets us to heaven, but it's how we live that determines the rewards that are received once we're there. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The Bible talks about these awards that are there for us. In races, you know, athletes, they're not awarded, uh, rewarded during the race. You don't have a guy running around the track and they're running out putting a gold medal around his neck. No, it's once the race is completed, it's then they call them forward and reward them. And how many of you know why we're running our race on earth? Rarely are you rewarded on planet earth, right? But there's going to be a time where we are called forward, where we are called to heaven and you are rewarded greatly for what you have done here. There's going to be a day. It was going, it's going to be an awesome day when the halls of heaven will thunder with applause as you are rewarded for, what, for the life you have lived on earth. It says that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are those witnesses? They are those that have already ran their race. I want you to think about the apostles. They're there. Moses is there. And right now in heaven, they're cheering you on in your race. And in one day, when you come before the beam of seat of Christ, and He's ready to reward you for the life you've lived here, there is going to be thunderous applause rattling through the corridors of heaven for a life well lived. I'm excited about that. Amen? I want to make a count. I want to make account. This is our time right here. Now, Paul was clearly thinking about that heavenly award ceremony when he said this to Timothy. He said, there is in store for me a crown of righteousness with which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And then look what he says. Not only to me, but also to all that have longed for his appearing. Did you know that just simply longing for his appearing is worthy of award in heaven? Did you guys know that? Are you eagerly looking forward to the Lord's return? He rewards that in heaven. You know, Paul was living in Corinth and his enemies drug him to court and charged him with trying to convince people to worship counter to what the law allowed. Now, scholars actually believe that the place that he stood is still visible today, the exact place where he stood, the Bema Seat. I talked with you about that a moment ago, but I want to continue on. It's called the Bema Seat, or in Greek, the Judgment Seat. It's a place where justice and reward are executed in that place. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, We must all appear. Let me hear you say all. Who is that? Okay, so you want to listen. It's like, wait a minute, I'm going to be there sometime. And so we must understand that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ, that each one may what? Receive what is due him for the things done. Where? While in the body. Receive what is due him for the things done 
while in the body, whether good or bad. What is he saying? Why you're here. Why you're in your life. Why you're in this little blip right here on the line of eternity. You'll be standing before Christ for that. Whether good or bad. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer. All of us stand before him. He narrows these rewards down to what happens while done in the body on earth. Now, two years later, he's in Rome. And the topic of this Bema seat comes up again. He says, for we all stand before God's judgment seat. Let me hear you say all. All. Does that include believers? Does that include non-believers? We all stand before the judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us must give an account of himself to God. Now, we wonder, well, what is this accounting? What does this accounting look like? And, you know, the Bible talks about this on how we give an account. And really what that accounting is, it's the testing of what did you do with the life God gave you? What did you do with the gifts I gave you? I gave you spiritual gifts. I gave you natural talents and abilities. I gave resources to you. What did you do with that? How did you use those things? Were they well used? And he talks about that the quality of that will be tested. Let me read it in Corinthians. It says, No one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, What's he talking about there? How many of you asked Jesus into your life? By the way, I don't think this is a very good sermon for anybody to fall asleep in. If somebody's sleeping, wake them up. They, need, they want to hear this. Okay? It says, no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if you've said yes to Jesus Christ, you have a foundation. Right? He's your foundation. Now let me continue what he says. If any man builds on that foundation, so whose responsibility is it now to build on what you've been given? You've put faith in Christ. He's come into your life. He's now the foundation of your life. What will you build on that? And he says, if any man builds on that foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, read verse 13 with me. His work will be shown for what it is. Because on the day... Uh, because the day will bring it to light. It will be, be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, what? He receives. If it is burned up, he will. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Did it say that when that accounting happens, that, that if you've said yes to Christ and all of a sudden you've kind of used your whole life, you know, just not really tending to that foundation well and is tested with fire, there's nothing left but the foundation that you're going to hell? Is that what that says? No, that's not at all what it says. It says you'll suffer loss because you've built with things that have no eternal value. Maybe you've built with wood. Hey, straw, when you test those with fire, where do they go? They're gone. And it says, there will be some, all they have left is the foundation. Now, a foundation will get you to heaven, amen? Because it's not your good works that get you there. It's Jesus Christ that gets you there. And so that foundation is bedrock. And so it's important that we understand that you got to build on the right foundation. The right foundation. The foundation is the most important part of any structure, right? It's going to determine the size. It's going to determine the shape. It's going to determine the strength. Now, Jesus is our foundation. So the question I have for you is, what are you building on it? What are you building? Are you building with things of value? Things that will outlast the dot? Gold? silver, costly stones, things that are rare, 
things that are hard to attain, things that when tested by fire become more valuable, things that when you build with those things, they will be carried on into eternity. Are you with me? But when you build with things that lack value, if the whole pursuit of your life is self-orientation, bigger and better, more money, more this, more that, that's wood, hay, and stubble. When those things are tested, they won't last. Those things don't go with you into eternity. Does that make sense? And so it's important that we build on the right foundation with the right stuff. We want to build on the foundation with things that will outlast us. You know, one of the things that this church is so great about doing is caring for other people. You feed homeless. You give coats to those who have none. I'd mentioned earlier that the best program our church has is the fact that we just believe that spirit-empowered people go out and live lives out there. And when you encounter the broken and suffering, you don't invite them to a program. You invite them to an encounter with Jesus Christ on the spot. And every time you make an investment in a human being, that is gold. That is silver. That is precious stone. When you make an investment in human beings who last forever, you are now living beyond the dot. You are living for things that will outlast in eternity. Amen? Let's give the Lord applause for that. The next thing is you want to build according to the right plan. How many of you have ever uh, built a home or built a structure? Raise your hand if you've ever been a part of building. Okay, Terry, what's, what do you follow when you're building? You follow a blueprint. Now, you don't get a blueprint and go, oh, that's nice. There's the foundation. Uh, let's build it over here. No, that doesn't work. You know, the engineers and the architects, they've decided this is, this is the shape of the building. This is how tall the building can be. This is what's necessary. So if you're going to build, you need to build according to the right plan. Now, did you know that God has a blueprint for your life? God has a plan for your life. And for a lot of folks, they want to tend to build on the things that are going to bring promotion, bring prestige, bring influence. But God has a purpose for your life that's a lot bigger than that. God's purpose is that you'd walk in intimacy with Him. That you would be a spirit-led person. That you would be a person that loves God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, your mind, and your strength. And that you love your fellow man as yourself. God's plan for your life requires personal sacrifice. God's plan for your life means putting God first. And in many cases, putting others first. And that's not a good, that's not a popular blueprint for people on this earth. But for us as followers of Jesus Christ to understand we're not living for the dot. We're living for the line. It's important that we live, that first off, we, we have the right foundation. And we build according to the right plan. His plan. God has a purpose for your life. And it's important that we find out what that purpose is. Amen? We build according to His plan. And then the last thing I want to say is you want to build according to the right motive. Our acts of service isn't so I can get more attention, so that everyone can applaud me and say, look at everything I'm doing for, for Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Now, I called Shamika and, uh, and Renee up here. And we said thank you uh, to them. But the fact is, they would have been happy to go the next 20 years without anybody saying thank you to them. Because their motive isn't your recognition. Their motive is to honor the Lord. And everything we do needs to be to honor Him. Amen? And when, we, when we understand that, you can do ordinary things. Even simple, ordinary acts and activities can bring glory to God. You know, the Bible says that even if you give a cold glass of water in your name, I will remember and you will be greatly 
rewarded in my kingdom. God doesn't forget a single thing. Amen? For the believer, you don't have to fear the Bema seat. It's the reward seat. But we ought to be mindful that the rewards we receive and where we spend eternity is all contingent on what we believe and what we do while in the body. This affects your forever life. And so we want to live lives that reflect that. Now, Paul said something that makes people very uncomfortable. And I addressed it, but I want to readdress it. He talked about suffering loss. Russ, could you find that verse again and put that up there? He talked about suffering loss. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. What is he talking about? What is he not talking about? He is not talking about you losing your salvation. Hallelujah. If you said yes to Jesus Christ, that foundation is, is rock solid. That's not at, at, that's not at risk. But there will be many who do suffer loss at the Bema seat when the works of their life are tested with fire because their works were wood, hay, stubble. They were things that really didn't matter outside of the blip on the timeline. So they suffer loss. So there will be those who say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but they've not taken that awesome foundation and built anything of lasting value on it. Maybe they didn't use their spiritual gifts. Maybe they didn't use their resources. Maybe they didn't use what they had to be mindful of what was beyond their life. So there will be some. They get into heaven, but like it says right there, there will only be a foundation left. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames, through the testing of their works. Now, I don't tell you this stuff to scare you, but it's very important. I would not be a very good pastor if I just told you, great, you said yes to Jesus Christ. Just do whatever you want. Live whatever life you want, because you're going to heaven. Without pausing for a moment and saying, no, you should pay attention. Because you don't want to build with wood, hay, and stubble. You want to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Things that outlast this life. It's an investment in other, other human beings. It's your acts of love and service and kindness. Those are the kinds of things that God rewards. He doesn't record, reward your bank account for Pete's sake. Amen? And some of you said, good, that's really good news. <laughs> Let me wrap up by saying a couple of things here. Even though there will be loss at the Bema seat for some, and there will probably be some loss for me too. I'm sure I call it accessorizing. Probably all of us do some accessorizing. It's just kind of fluff, but it's things that don't matter. I'm sure there's going to be things in my life that the Lord will burn those things away. It's like, that don't need to go into heaven with us. That don't need to go into eternity. So there will be some things left behind. There will be some things left behind for me, and there will probably be some things left behind for you as well. It's important, though, that we understand the main purpose for a believer at the Bema seat is the reward seat. It is the reward seat. And by the way, Man, if all I do is just get there, that's pretty good. I'm in heaven, amen? But God wants more than that for you. He wants more. You know, the Bible says that at that moment, that he will wipe every tear from your eye. I'm not sure exactly what that moment might be like, but when he says, I'll wipe every tear from your eye, there might be a moment where we say, wow, I could have done more with my gifts. I could have done more with my resources. I could have done more with the opportunities. But the Lord says, yeah, but that regret stops right here. That's not going with you into heaven. I'm going to wipe those tears of regret 
from your eyes so that you can enter into my kingdom and you can fully enjoy the love and the relationship, all that I prepared for you. What a gracious and kind and merciful Lord we, we worship. Amen. When it comes to your foundation, if you've said yes to Christ, you don't lose that. But you should be wise on how you build on it. Terry, you've been a part of building projects. You ever seen somebody building something? It's like, you shouldn't be using that material. That's cheap stuff. That ain't going to last. And they cut corners and this and that. Some of you bought houses like that. Where down the road you discover the builder didn't use quality stuff and now you're paying the price for that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, my roof is falling in. The walls are falling down. What's that? <laughs> you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. And can I just tell you, we want to build with the right motive. The right motive. Let me say this. We don't do good works just so I can get more rewards in heaven. The right motive is, God, I want to do things because it becomes an expression of my love and my worship to you. When you do it with the right heart, it has sustainability. When you do it with the wrong heart, it'll burn you out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm going to ask if we could bow our heads together. Jesus, you're our Savior. You're our baptizer in the Holy Spirit. You're our healer. And you're our soon coming King. There's going to be a day where we will stand before you. Just like those runners. They're not rewarded while they're running around the track. But they're called forth. And there's going to be a day that you're going to reward us for the things that were done while in the body. And I pray, Lord, that we'd understand that and begin to take it serious. And we'd be, we'd be mindful to, to, to what we do with our lives, and it would be gold, silver, and costly stones when it comes to it being tested, when it comes to the accounting that's coming. I pray for that. Folks, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, is there anybody you need to get your heart right with God today? Maybe you've never asked him in your life, or maybe you have at some point, but it's time for you to recommit yourself to him. There ain't no better day than today for that. If you want to commit or recommit, throw your hand in the air where you're at. Raise it up high if that's you. Raise them up. Amen. I see your hand, and I see yours. Anybody else today? I see yours and yours. Over here, I see your hand. I see yours in the back. Church, can we pray together? Dear Lord, I receive all you did on the cross for me as a payment for my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Empower me to live for you. And help me live a life that reflects my devotion to you. 